the last uh, forum we did a couple weeks ago, uh, we're supposed to have a meet and greet at 6.30, but most people are just coming in ready to start, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dave Jack, superintendent of Fucker County Schools. This is the second superintendent's forum. Uh, we'll be doing two more. We tried to stagger them. We tried to stagger the times and locations to meet as many people's schedules as possible. Uh, that have done a fairly good job, I guess. Summer is always a tough time. Uh, but um, the first one was very well attended. And um, what I'll do is do a short presentation, uh, um, try and give you as much information as I can as far as um, what I've discovered so far about Falker County Schools, a little bit about my background, um, my philosophy, um, my vision, and then I'll open it up to any questions you have. But I'll, I'll warn you that there are so many issues and pieces to the puzzle. And uh, so far, I started May 1st. So far, I, n I really got my brain wrapped around about this much. There's a lot of pieces. I don't ha have all the information I need. I have not formulated an opinion or a, a vision or whatnot. But so if you have questions and I can answer it, I will. If I can't answer it, I'll tell you that I can't answer it. Um, or if it's something that I just need to do some research, I will do that as well. But right now I'm researching a lot of different things just to try to learn as much as I can. And there's a lot to learn. My last school division was six schools, 3,000 students, and I could literally walk out of my office and walk to four, four of the six schools or right at the door to my office. So this is a little bit different. But it is funny to be in Falkir and people talk about Falkir as the small school division. Uh, to me, it's immense. So it just t takes some getting used to and takes a little bit of time. But this really is about where do we go from here. And um, this is sort of, sort of part of my entry plan. And it is also part of the learning phase, the gathering as much information as I can from you and from other stakeholders about where we go from here as Falkir County Public Schools. Uh, and so what I've done th thus far, lots of school visits, about 60 school visits. Um, and they've been purposeful visits for the most part, visiting t uh, classrooms, teachers, administrators, and whatnot, or going to different programs. Lots of meetings um, with local politicians and community members. I met with Senator Jill Vogel today for lunch. That was an excellent meeting. She's a real school advocate, education advocate. So that was a very positive meeting. But lots of local politicians, parents, community members, community events. I've attended several of those. Um, about a million emails, texts, phone calls, and Twitter messages. Uh, Fauquier County folks like to email, so I'm learning that. And I, and I take great pride in trying to get back to every e email within 24 hours. So far, so good. Um, it's a little different, again, from my last school division, but uh, so far, so good as far as returning messages and emails and whatnot. Reaching out and in, I've uh, started a few different things just as a way to communi communicate and to get feedback in. Uh, and that's um, contained within my blog. Uh, I do have a Twitter account. That's what Reed and I were just talking about. Uh, we were talking about the superintendent, and, and Almar has got over 30,000 tweets. I think I have about 300. Um, but it's just a way to share information. I try to retweet things that I think are important and helpful, and pieces of information I think are helpful. If you're interested in following me on Twitter, it's at Dr. Jack. That's my, that's my handle. Uh, Friday Features is something I send to board members about things that are coming up, issues coming up, et cetera. And then my superintendent's page is a new thing on the website where you can go there. I'll give updates. It has my blog entries and has my Twitter posts for the most part, although it's, it's having a hard time around keeping up because it's, there's some kind of glitch, but it's supposed to post every one of my Twitter messages, but it hasn't been doing that, but we'll fix it. And then uh, we're doing a web page redesign. Uh, again, that was something that I think our web page is, is pretty good. I, I don't know that it's terribly user-friendly, so um, we are looking at a, a design right now to make it more user-friendly and less busy. Uh, as Again, it has lots of information, but I, w I felt like it was too busy. Uh, so we're working with, uh, uh, with tech staff to uh, redesign the web page, and that is in progress. Uh, and these are just some general observations I wanted to share with folks. Um, Fauquier takes great pride in the education that it provides to its students. Uh, that, that comes through loud and clear. That came through loud and clear before I started here, uh, something that's very obvious to the school division. Uh, the sky's the limit. What I've heard from parents thus far is they want more opportunities for their kids, uh, more sort of more far-reaching, upper-level opportunities for kids uh, because the sky's the limit in terms of what, um, A, parents expect, and B, what our kids can do. Uh, so that's something that I'm very, very uh, cognizant of. Uh, I feel like our facilities are well-maintained, clean, and attractive, and that's, um, again, it's a nice change. We have 
uh, a good uh, uh, resource in terms of the maintenance of our, of our buildings and the custodial piece. Our buildings are in good shape, and I believe me, I've been to a lot of school divisions where that was not the case, and uh, we're fortunate here, I think. Organizational structure, I think, is good, logical, and efficient. Uh, there is a lot of frustration, and this is actually a positive thing as far as I'm concerned. A lot of frustration with the state assessment system. Uh, that's, I think, a statewide thing. There is frustration with the state assessment system, and to get on my soapbox just for a minute, the SOL testing system that we have currently in the, in the state is, was really developed to address a 1980s problem. It was really addressed, if you dig deep enough back, to address uh, a, a, a problem that was identified through the na a nation at risk study. And this ass uh, assessment program was sort of developed around that. And there are, there are good parts to it and there are bad parts to it. Uh, the good part is it really got us focused on every single child and the, the success or the achievement of every single child. The bad thing is, is we, it's the, still the system we have 20 some odd years later, 30 years later even. But it was created to address a problem that existed back in the 80s. So we're in a different place now. Now the expectation is that we teach to 21st century standards, that we're preparing kids for what lies ahead in terms of you know, 21st, 21st century skills um, the STEM, you've heard, if you've read my blog or my, tweet or my tw uh, tweets, I talk a lot about STEM because that's what lies ahead. That's what's sort of next. And what we've got in terms of assessment, it's not authentic assessment. It is multiple choice tests. And I, I've told the story many times that when I was a principal, we used to keep foreign exchange students, and they just marveled at the multiple choice test. They'd never taken a multiple choice test until they came to the United States. And I'd say, well, what did you do? And they'd say, well, they would ask the question, and you would answer the question. He said, here, they, the, the answer is there. You just have to pick the right one. And that's very telling, because that's, that is, but that's the system that we, you know, we're sort of stuck with. And I think there are attempts, I don't think I know, there are, there are attempts going on right now to adjust the test so they're a little more authentic, they're a little more product-oriented, you know, show me what you know, demonstrate that you can do this thing. But for the most part, it's still more the same. It's a multiple choice test. But, but it's good to hear in Fauquier the same frustration I heard in Green, which is, you know, can't we, can't we teach, you know, authentically? Can't we measure, you know, authentic learning? And can't we have kids do projects and capstone projects and service learning projects and all those things? And yes, we can. We can do both. We can do that. We can instruct that way and teach the standards. They c it can be done. And lots of folks are doing it. Um, staff turnover is low. And I do feel like this is a preserve and enhance situation. And just, again, a little bit about my background. I was superintendent for five years in my last school division. That was Greene County. When I was hired there as superintendent, the expectation was roll a grenade in and start all over. They wanted a complete rebranding, complete change of the school division, it's bottom to top. They wanted complete overhaul and complete change. And so that's what we did. Uh, I don't think that's a situation here at all. I think it's more of a preserve and enhance situation. We're doing a lot of things really well. Uh, we can do some of the things better, but we're doing a lot of things really well right now, and we can make them great. Uh, so we are definitely perched to go from good to great. We're ready to make that leap. I and I really believe that. I think that's where Fauquier County Schools is. Uh, my path is, I know you don't want to hear about me, but just quickly, so you know, from Whittier, California, and I'm the youngest of seven. I'm the youngest of 11, if you count my step-siblings. Um, I went to Nyack College in uh, New York, Southern Miss, and then UVA for my doctorate. I've been married 23 years. I have two sons, Caleb and David. I wrote a little bit about David. I was just uh, texting him back and forth. He's in culinary school. He's going to be a chef. And uh, he's very excited about that. And uh, my wife and I learned a really valuable lesson with our oldest son because, you know, we were, were both educators. And it was college, college, college. And, um, you know, we sent him off to college. And it was a crash and burn scenario completely. And we knew after about two months, it, college wasn't working for him. So he came home after a year. He did okay with grades. But, you know, for that much money a year, he wasn't loving it. And we thought, well, you need to take a year off then and work, which he did. Worked in a restaurant, fell in love with it, is now becoming a chef, and, and absolutely loves it. So lesson learned for us as parents. 
uh, I was a high school social studies teacher, and I was also a high school principal for seven years and uh, five years' experience as superintendent. And this is a, just an absolute dream opportunity for me, not to suck up too much, but uh, absolute. Um, when I was offered this position, I uh, was so humbled and so blessed, um, and I still feel that way, and I'm sure I'll continue to feel that way. This is just a tremendous place, tremendous community, tremendous school division. Um, just you know, just right in so many respects, and um, and so my wife and I are absolutely thrilled to become part of the community. And we made an offer on a house today, so keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully that'll work out. We'll be residents very very soon. My vision, and I did this. This is a. Uh, I'm going to show you my uh, tech savviness right here. If I can, I do this. Look at that. Took that. Took me three hours to do that. Um, Really, it's and this is one of the it's one of these things that my firm belief is. It's really not about my vision. I think as I became a school leader, you know, I learned pretty quickly that if you come into any situation with this, let me tell you what my vision. You're going to fail. It's really our vision. I mean, your vision is obviously important. My vision is obviously important to the success and uh, sort of the nurturing of the school division. But when it comes to the day to day, it's really our what our vision is, and that's why we're here now, um, because I'm not, uh, I've never been a fan of school leaders who come and say, well, here's my, vi here's my pre-canned vision, and this is what we're going to do. I just don't think that's a very effective way to lead. Um, and, and by the way, this is, this truly is, though, this is, as a teacher and a school leader, this is sort of the principles uh, under which I've, I've, um, I've worked. Uh, never underestimate kids. I've learned it doesn't matter where you set the bar for kids. Kids will always surprise you. It's almost impossible to set the bar too high, I think. If you set the bar too low, the same thing, you're going to get the same thing. They're going to meet your expectation. But, but I do think the higher you set the bar, the kids will surprise you every time. Uh, opinions abound, but in the end, what I'll always rely on is what I feel is in the best interest of students, and that's kind of the question I'll start difficult sit or discussions with is what, what's the best thing we can do for kids? Um, can't please everyone, and if I try to please everyone, I'll please no one, and then we're looking for a new superintendent, and no one wants that. Right, Mr. Warner? Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I do believe fir firmly, we're going to talk about STEM here in a minute, and I, you know, I do believe you've always got to be looking for what lies ahead and what's coming next. And as a principal, what I used to tell my staff was, you know, we should be always in a situation where we are informing central office what we are going to do. Here's our plan. Here's how we intend to help students and, and be proactive and, and sort of look down the road. The other way around is not, uh, in my mind, an effective way to lead a school or a school division. It's what you, we are looking at what's ahead. What's the data telling us about what lies ahead and which direction are we going? Um, and I'm, I'm you know, again, I am certainly someone willing to go out on a limb, and um, that's something I've done consistently. And I can tell you a couple of years ago, um, we were so fed up with the entire AYP, AMO, state accreditation, every, you know, the whole accountability fiasco that's going on in the state and at the federal level right now. We did get to, I did get to that point where I did say to my staff, you know, we just, let's back up and take a, the 35,000 foot view of this and start making decisions and instructing it in ways that are best for kids. And let's not worry about this other piece because it's just not, it's not working for students. And um, fortunately, that's a message that I'm hearing more and more often coming from um, the school leaders around the state. What didn't originate with me, that's for sure. Uh, there was others like Pam Rand and Al Mall, for example, who was, she was way ahead of the curve on that. Uh, and so that's, and I think that's the way you have to look at it is you got to be willing to take risks, go out on a limb. Uh, expectations have changed. Again, when we talk about 21st century, and you'll, and you'll hear me um, talking more and more about this as, as I'm um, working for the school division, is what, you know, we need to be instructing, teaching, and providing opportunities relevant to 21st century um, expectations. And they have changed. And this, this is some notable examples. And my first, the, the first is actually my favorite. You know, we have 1,865 standards in Virginia. When SOL testing was sort of initiated, 
everyone was hitting the panic button re related to we got to cover all the material. And that's where things started going south quickly. We got to cover all this material. And I taught social studies at that time, and you know, I had a 36 chapter world history book or American history book. And the pressure that was sort of being applied was you've got to cover all this material. Well, coverage and understanding are two completely different things. And uh, there's, there's a difference between a two mile wide, you know, two inch deep uh, ditch versus a two inch wide, two mile deep ditch. It's deeper, and that's where we need to be as a school division. We need to be providing deep, deeper instruction. And that's not just Fauquier County, that's everywhere. Um, because what we've got now, or what we've had, is you've got to cover, 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 and it's just jamming information down in kids' throats, and then they take a test, and the test is over, and then they forget everything two weeks later. And that's not learning. But that's sort of the hand that we've been dealt, and we've got to do something about it, and I think in Fauquier we've got a chance to do something significant about it. Uh, and so that's exciting. And then just a couple of others. Um, technology, again, um, technology is something that's uh, obviously very important to me. Uh, important to our students, but technology, again, used to be one of those novelty items, and as we started buying, you know, machines for teachers, for classrooms, you know, they really started off as a novelty and, and you know, something that wasn't a meaningful part of instruction, daily instruction. Well, that's got to change. Technology needs to be a daily part, a meaningful part of everyday instruction, but to get there, that's hard. That's very difficult. Because the students are way ahead of where we are, um, and this you've heard about BYOD, they're 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 way past. You know, my kids were uh, you know horrified when I got a Facebook. You know, tried to friend them on Facebook. Well, they're they they're way up past Facebook. Now they're on Twitter, so I'm on Twitter, and they're on to something else. You know, they're they're looking at something else. So um, they're they're ahead of they're way ahead of where we were or we are, and um, we got to take advantage of that because they're a lot savvier than we are. And that technology piece, it's got to be a, sort of a daily part of your, the instructional um, operations of the school. It has to be. And that, that's going to be hard on the adults. It won't be hard on the kids because they already got it. And the BYOD thing is, you know, I've heard lots of different opinions shared. I can tell you we went through this in my last school division. We instituted a BYOD policy, told kids you can bring your devices, here's the expectations, and then we all held our breath. You know, we were all waiting for that first week, and both my kids were at the school at the high school at that point. Um, we all sort of held our breath on what's going to happen with BYOD and all these devices. And in our school division, anyway, not much of anything happened. The school looked the same. We expected to see kids everywhere bumping into each other, texting, and you know, everyone on their phone during lunchtime. And we didn't see it. We saw pretty much the same thing we saw <laughs> prior to the policy change. Because the kid, for the kids, the novelty is already worn off. You know, it's, it's just part of their existence. Um, but what we've got to do as the, as the adults is harness it and use those devices to instruct. That's key, and that's, the really, that's really the hard part. Uh, what does 21st century teaching and learning look like, and what do we mean when we talk about it? Well, this is a very busy slide, and I, w I won't read it to you. But what it, what it really comes down to is 21st century, what employers and colleges expect from our kids is sort of mu pretty much encapsulated there. They expect well-rounded kids. They expect the whole child. When I was a CT director years ago, employers would literally come to our school. Employers like Martin Horn is a big construction outfit in Charlottesville area. And uh, some of the local uh, car dealers would come to us and, and say literally, we'll hire all of your graduates. We'll hire all of them. All we want you to do is teach them soft skills. Teach them how to get to work on time, how to look people in the eye when they talk to them, how to shake hands, make sure that they're shaved and their teeth brushed when they come to work every day. Those are the kinds of things those employers were asking for. Because they said, we can teach them. If they've got those soft skills and they're willing, willing to collaborate, that was another very important piece. If they're willing to collaborate with the people that they work with, we can teach them all these other skills. We can teach them, the, and we will teach them those things. But we just need good people to come in and work in our businesses. That was, an, an, again, another lesson learned. But the point is, that fits, 21st century skills fits into everything. Fits into global awareness and, and civic responsibility, cultural awareness, 
flexibility, adaptability, health education, et cetera, et cetera. And the goal is to develop well-rounded students. And, um, and that's going to better prepare them for the workplace and for the college, and for college, if they decide to go to college. Or maybe it's training school, tech school, military. Uh, but developing those well-rounded students and preparing them for what lies ahead is key. But we've got to know what lies ahead. Uh, STEM, you may or may not have read or heard anything, or heard anything uh, as far as uh, my comments about STEM, uh, but I was not a science teacher or math teacher because, you know, someone recently said, well, you know, you taught science, so of course it's important. No, I didn't. I taught social studies. I taught history. But I see what's coming, and what's coming is encapsulated right there. Currently, there's 3 million unfilled STEM-related jobs in the United States. By 2017, there's going to be, or 2018, 8.6 million new STEM-related jobs. And you juxtapose that with the fact that 1% of our college graduates are even majoring in a science, as opposed to 20 and 30% in Asia, um, you know, overseas. So th they're, they've got it. Um, I can tell you a few years ago, I took a trip to India. We visited a bunch of schools. And these, these you know, impoverished kids. But they were some of the most engaged students I've ever met. And they were so anxious to engage the adults and ask questions about. I had one kid come and ask me about it was when McDonald was running for governor. And he asked me about the election in Virginia. What do I think about McDonald's chances? I, you know, I was in Mumbai, India. You know, he was asking me these questions about the, ele the governor's election in, in Virginia. Uh, so they're, they, you know, th those folks sort of get what's coming and what the expectations are going to be. And, you know, math drives everything. Uh, we've had real serious conversations about what are we, what are we doing with math. Uh, we need to have m a lot more kids taking Algebra 2 and completing Algebra 2 at the high school level. Again, my last school division, we, had a, we created a math timeline whereby all eighth graders would have either algebra or geometry by the time they left middle school. We got to about 95%. And the reason we did that was because those kids need algebra too. If they intend to go to a good college in Virginia, or most any college in Virginia, they've got to have algebra too. They must have algebra too. Um, and if we're not giving them algebra by you know, eighth grade, we're putting them behind at a huge disadvantage in terms of taking more upper level math courses. And they've got to have them. Because it's not for us to decide in eighth grade, who is and isn't going to go to college, or is, is or isn't going to go to a, a trade school or a, a technical school where they're going to need math skills. Uh, we need to give that to them when they're still in middle school. It's very important so that they're able to take the upper level math courses. Um, and just the last piece, again, going back to the college and the employers and what they want, what they, what they expect, um, all those things I mentioned, th those are real. You know, those are the expectations uh, coming from employers and from colleges. More well-rounded students. Half the students that go to college right now in the United States never finish college after six years. Half. So 50% of the kids going off to college are probably not going to finish. And then what? So then what do we do? You know, what lies ahead for them? Because those kids, they have a couple of options at that point. If college didn't work for them, you know, A, they better find something that they're interested in quick. Or they're going to end up doing something not very rewarding in terms of employment for the rest of their lives. So it's better to prepare them as best we can while they're still in with us. And then later on, if college doesn't work out, they, they'll have some options, hopefully. Last, if you know, you're looking for the one sort of statement, quote, um, sort of sums up what I believe, uh, what, I, what I stand for, uh, where I hope to see the school division go, it's right there. It's from an executive from Google when he was asked about what, what he expected, what they expected from new employees. And he said, we're not looking for people that know a lot of facts. We're, we're Google. We already have all the facts. We're looking for people that can take an ill-defined problem and work collaboratively in order to solve it. And I think that sort of encapsulates, encapsulates what, what I've been talking about, what my vision is, where, where, I, what I, think, where I think we need to go. Um, it's right there. Because that's what folks, that's what colleges, employees, employers, excuse me, are looking for. Well-rounded folks who can work together, who can collaborate and solve problems. And we can start that process when they're right here with us. So that was a lot. Uh, and I said 20 minutes. My part was going to be 20 minutes. How do I do, Reed? 
Really? I did really well. I did less than 20 minutes. All right, good. Um, so that was a lot of information. And by the way, uh, this presentation is, is posted um, on the county website. If you go to it, it'll say superintendent's page. Just click on that. It's there. And you, you're welcome to do whatever you want with it or do nothing with it. It's up to you. Uh, but if you take your notes or whatever and you missed any of this, it's right there. You can go to the website and um, visit that and do whatever you like with it. So, all right, so my part's done. So now it's time for questions or comments. So who is going to be first? Yes, ma'am. Shana, right? Oh no, he's the man I want to. Oh, well, I didn't think this through. Um, yeah, I'm glad on you're cameras to boot, so. you're redesigning the webpage because it is a mess. It's hard to get, like, even to find the contact information for, uh, for you or for school board members. It's it's a bunch of steps to yeah. get to each thing. Um, Agreed. Besides that, uh, I'm glad you're very focused on STEM. Uh, my husband, is he does tech work, and he's always felt that the kids don't get enough early exposure to, personally, the more technical, uh, like coding and type things. Coding, yeah. Um, that's, that's a big one, coding. Uh, you know, it's, we're not talking about keyboarding here or yeah. even CIS. We're talking about like coding skills, developing apps, things like that. That's a good point. There you go, security. Um, and I am glad you're focused on math. We uh, we both talk with our sons about that a lot. But I do know coming from my family, I was always very good at math, but my sister couldn't do math to save her life. She would, if it was forced upon her, she, she would have just gotten Fs. But um, so I do think it's good to, to believe that every kid should have exposure and be able to to work towards it, but it's unrealistic to think that all will do well with it, even if it's uh, more I don't know, focused on. S that. Sometimes with math, I mean, I know what you're saying. Sometimes with math, it comes out of the way we teach math, and and math is traditionally a very traditional instructional content area. I mean, that's sometimes people who aren't good with math, if the class is taught very traditionally, uh, it's hard for them. It's hard for me. I'm, well, I'm not a math person. Never have been a math person. Neither, neither are my kids. Um, the, my, both my kids struggle with algebra too, very much. Um, but you know, one went on and, and did you know pre-calc, but um, the other was just glad to get that algebra too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just yeah, and he even passed the SOL test. Woo. So um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I follow you. That's really it. Great. Me. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? We got one here, and then I'll come right to you. Even though you got a Red Sox cap on. I'll keep you here all night. Okay, here we go. Kevin Euclid has a question right here. He's not a Red Sox um, anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he's with the other class. Um, you're talking a lot about science and technology and math and stuff like that, and you, you mentioned coding, which that's what I actually do for a living. Wow, okay. Um, I remember 100 years ago there was nothing in regular school for in, in the uh, high school lower for that. Um, so I'm glad to see that. Like to see more of that. But um, the biggest problem I see, I've been in the county for eight years. My wife works at one of the elementary schools here, and uh, is not a STEM person at all. She's a art teacher. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, the big thing that I see is is the teachers are not using technology with the kids, the, with the resources that they have. They have, and you talk about website, there's at least three different systems. There's Angel, there's the FCPS one website, and there's another thing that the teachers use, you know, even know what it's called. Blackboard. Blackboard. My son is, went through seventh grade this year. I think two of his teachers, I got regular emailed reports, all his grades and everything. It was wonderful. But the other seven teachers that he had throughout the year did not use it. Um, they say that they put their assignments and stuff up there on a daily basis. Two out of nine do that, you know. 
So I think there's got to be something to hold the teachers to a standard um, will help the kids is, is one thing. Yeah, and it's, it's to the point related to the kids. The kids are already at their head of where most adults are. But it's that expectations. And, I mean, this is the direction we're going. we got teach uh, Administrator Academy in a couple of weeks. And you know, one, of the, one of the slides I'm putting together is this, this is real. This is, where, this is where we're going. And this is, these are the needs that we've got. And technology has to be daily, every day, part of a meaningful instruct, uh, curriculum every single day. And that's a very important expectation. Glad to hear you use, reward, use the word expectation because that's what it's really we're talking and about. And on the other hand, like I said, my wife is not a STEM person. She's an art person. So STEAM like person. STEAM. Heard, yeah. Like she was saying, her sister was not a math person. There's lots of people in the world that are like that. You know, yeah. We're complete opposite. <laughs> I'm a math guy. She's not. So there's got to be an avenue for both. You know. But um, another thing I'd like to bring up on my other shoe, I'm representative of the county baseball league as well. And there's been a lot of turmoil in this county with sports over the last year or so. Uh, middle school sports? Middle school sports, freshman sports, just sports in general. You know, basically, there are no middle school and freshman sports anymore. Yeah, I hadn't heard anything about that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you haven't. <coughs> but uh, I'd, li I'd like to, to just keep that in, in, in your uh, uh, attention zone. And um, also, I don't know if anybody's – I'm sure somebody's brought it up, but uh, counties around our – that's surrounding us have the opportunity for uh, uh, eighth graders uh, to be able to play JV, in which they'd be freshmen or JV sports. Right. Um, before, while well, they're in eighth grade, I guess for spring, whatever. So yeah, they're on my frontal lobe because I've heard. Like a lot to about see it. a lot more, a lot more of that opportunity for the, for those kids. Cause sure, I understood. I hear you. That's a college avenue for a lot of them, absolutely. Well, kids are involved so. in sports are more likely to do three things. Uh, go to college, get good grades, and stay out of trouble. Yeah. And that's not me. That's <laughs> that's that is statistically significant. It's, it's the way it is. It's the truth. Next. Sure. No problem. Thank you. I cough a lot. Uh, I will send you the information on NICE, NICE. tomorrow. Yep. Uh, that stands for the National Information Assurance Cybersecurity Education Program. What the government is looking to do is to bring cybersecurity down to the high school, middle schools, and elementary schools. It only requires somebody from the school system to step forward and say, yeah, we'd like you to come down and help us with our curriculum. The other thing is to look up ISSA-NOVA.org, um, contact the president, Alex Gorman. They have a mentoring problem, or program, I should say, not a problem, uh, where they're currently going into the universities and mentoring students in various aspects of IT. Um, I do computer security. I'm a veteran. I look at things from, a, from many different angles. I can take a defensive fighting position and show you the relationship to an information system. So there's any number of ways that you can improve this whole process. Right. Have you ever thought about having a job fair, bringing in the local IT businesses and so forth? Because they're always looking for entry-level personnel in different areas other than IT. There's supply, there's administration, and so forth. And it would give these individuals a chance to take and see what the real world is like when you go to a job fair and right. what they're looking for, how you're supposed to dress, act, and the questions they'll be asking, and whether or not you have this certification mm -hmm. or uh, otherwise. Yeah, it's important. You know, we at, at the last forum, we, we talked about, you know, how you leave an impression. A 17-year-old kid leaves an impression when he comes up to an adult and says, hey, how are you? My name's Dave. It's nice to meet you. I mean, it, those things are important. They're important to employers. And sometimes I'll give kids, adults, an edge when in hiring because they're willing to communicate. Uh, but, I, Major, do we do any kind of job fairs for kids? We do some drive through for employees and candidates. Right.
and, and very impressed by your students, by the way, at that at, uh, interview. Th those were, the kids were great. Right. Okay. Great. Because I, I know I haven't received anything about a job fair at the high school. My son's been here two years. I'll have to get on his gang about it. <laughs> Great. Um, and then part of the IT field is getting a certification. The big push these days is everybody must have a CISSP, and that requires four years of experience and a waiver, three years of experience, college degree and a waiver. So, you know, it's out there whether or not the individual wants to go for it. That's something entirely different but it also has the fact that if you're in college and you take the CISSP exam and pass it they'll list you as an associate CISSP and you'll have that until you get the full experience someone with a CISSP they're almost guaranteed a $65,000 a year minimum start anywhere in this country so and there's even if you go out to CSSP and look at the waiver process, there's like 42 different additional certs that ISC Square recognizes, but a lot of the companies don't recognize them. So you get into computer forensics where you're tracking the criminals through the system. Uh, CEH, uh, Certified Ethical Hacker, which is basically seeing what holes you can find. You have auditing, you have management. There's a whole lot of certs out there some of them don't even require experience. It's just the fact that you can go down, take the test, and pass it, and you got it. Yeah, there was a great article in the uh, Washington Post recently about uh, careers that don't require college degrees, and they were, you know, there were eight or nine of them, and I think six or seven of them were they were technology related. They they required the training, they didn't require a degree necessarily, and they were all well-paying jobs. I mean, they were they were. Well, the youngest job. person to pass the CISSP, and this was several years ago, he was 16 years old. And the reason he qualified for five years, he worked in his father's computer repair store. So awesome. there Great are experience. 10 domains, and if you're a security guard for f five years, you qualify to take the exam. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. you got to wait for the microphone so you get on tape. Hi, uh, my name is Benita Ribeiro, and I'm both a parent and a teacher. Um, and I actually have five questions for you. So one of the questions has to do with your comment about um, in eighth grade, we can't say who will and won't go to college, and that we want to give as much math as possible to the students early on. So at what point do you feel you could say who will and won't go to college, considering that you said 50% of the students who do go to college either were inadequately prepared and so they return within, without right. getting a degree, or maybe never had needed to go there in the first place and right. would have been better directed elsewhere? I mean, well, that's an excellent question, and, and I think if I had the answer, I'd, be, uh, you know, I'd make a million dollars. First of all, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily ever our role to say, you're going to go to college and you aren't. You know, my oldest brother is 10 years older. He graduated college the same year I did, 1988, because he went military and then decided to get his business degree much later on in life. So I don't know that there's ever a time where you make that decision, but I, I guess my point was if you equip the students with as much as possible and, and give them the tools they need to make a good decision, then they'll make a good decision. But if we're all pushing in the same direction, you will do this. And this is true with my own child. You know, you're, here's what we want you to do. This is what we think you're going to do. When I knew I had this kind of nagging feeling that I don't know if he's going to make it. I don't, I don't know if he's ready to do this. And sure enough, that's what happened. So I don't, I don't know that we're ever able to, but I think we've got to prepare kids for whichever direction they go as best we can. So because we say we don't believe in tracking, and yet – in a way, if you think about it, colleges are the ultimate form of tracking mm -hmm. because you have to meet certain expectations. You have to apply. It's a rigorous process, and they're definitely a cut. So 
in a classroom where you try to integrate students of various abilities, those who are mathematically oriented and those who aren't, I don't feel it's easy or fair to be able to serve them all in the same way. I think it's much easier for both the student and the teacher. When I say easier, I'm not saying that I, w in the sense of less work, but more productive mm -hmm. to be able to have some form of tracking. Well, you know, tracking, when, I'm, when I think of tracking, I think about the old days when it was the Bluebirds and the Cardinals and so on. And tracking started when they were in second grade. And it continued right on through 12th grade. What I'm talking about has more to do with you we're preparing kids. Because math skills will follow the kid wherever he goes, whatever he does, if he has those math skills. But when they get on into the high school, our job, one of the jobs that we have is to direct kids where we think they're going to be proficient and successful. Um, but... I just I don't think we're doing them any favors if we're holding them back in the math area. And I'll give you a really good example. It used to be in high schools, and it's probably still true in most high schools. It may even be true here. You know, we slowed down the curriculum, especially the math curriculum. We slowed it down to make sure kids passed that Algebra 1 test. And what we ended up with was Algebra Part A and Algebra Part B. And then that turned into Geometry Part A and Geometry Part B. So those each became year-long courses. You got the first half of algebra in one year, and then the second half of algebra in the next year. And you know what happened to kids? They hated math by the time they were juniors and seniors. They hated it. And it, data showed it didn't make any difference in the achievement of those kids. Slowing down the curriculum, dumbing it down, it didn't make any different with, difference with the achievement of those students. So I do think it's important that we you know, are cognizant of what the kids' skills are, and we're directing them towards it. If it's CT, if they have an affinity for fixing vehicles, those guys make a lot of money, so I don't think it's a bad idea. To, if the kids got an affinity there, we put them in, we push them in that direction. But that's part of our job at the high school levels, where we are counseling kids and guiding kids where we think they're going to be most successful. But I, I still think that math piece is math follows kids everywhere. My other question was, um, I am a native of India, but I don't know how much I can claim since I've been here since I was five and a half. But when you were in Mumbai, did you see students with devices, or what did you see that no. to you was different? <laughs> wow, that's such a good question. Here, I'll tell you what I saw. I saw a, a classroom with 40 kids sitting on mats on the floor taking a computer applications course with no computer. The teacher was teaching the course on a chalkboard. There wasn't a machine in the room. And their, their, their computer labs were very sparse. You know, they had them, but they, were, they weren't very good. They were outdated. And they, you know, the, what they shared with us was the scheduling piece is a nightmare, trying to get the kids in to use them. It was very, very difficult. But what impressed me most about the kids was just, it wasn't necessarily the, the, uh, the, uh, the device piece. It was their engagement. And they were just so, they had ownership of their own learning. You know, and they talked about they wanted to go to the States. They wanted to go to college in the States. That was a huge thing. You know, I want to go to the U.S. and go to school. Um, I've took it, taken the pre-SAT, and here's what I got. And, um, but as far as their resources, they were pretty abysmal. So I, I think you could say that they were focused, but maybe not. I, I think that we could get to a state where we confuse distraction with technology mm -hmm. with learning through technology. And I'm, I think... It's laudable, yes, that the kids are there and they know all of these things, but they're using them usually for fairly frivolous yeah. activities. Yep. And you know why? Because we've done a poor job as adults of making it a meaningful part of the daily instruction. What we've said is, I'll pull out the smart board once a week and we'll go to the computer lab once a week, maybe. It's not part of the sort of the daily instructional pattern. You know, if they're bringing these devices, these handheld devices, smartphones, for example, into the classroom, that's a powerful teaching device. But training teachers to use it that way is tough. It's very, very difficult. It takes a lot of time, and it takes will. It takes the will to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up with what you just said, which is just it's just a novelty. It's just something to to have. And I guess my last comment is that to say STEM is where it's going. I think, though, that we've been hearing that for years and years. I remember 
Um, I also graduated from, well, I think you said 88. Was that from college? 88 college, yeah. Okay, that same year. But my en degree is in engineering, and that time the focus was really women and minorities in engineering. And so I think that that push has been going on for a long time, but there's actually been a decline in women in computer science yes. and other degrees. And I've seen that in the middle school level. A lot of times the girls are the diligent ones. They'll do the homework. They've got it, but they're so timid. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to throw that as a comment. Yeah, That's not really a question. Yep. You, you offer environmental science, and you'll see you'll have a lot of girls who sign up for environmental science. You know, ecology, they'll sign up for that. That's interesting to them. I, and I'm not, hopefully this doesn't come across as sexist because it's not. But they will, they're interested in those subjects. They're not interested in the engineering as much. It's not as valuable to them for whatever reason. So, again, we've got to, you know, sort of pander to their needs. Is there anybody else with the mic? Yeah, anyone else? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to let you use my mic. I just have a question about, um, well, it's not a question. It's about the middle schools, I'm in. We're in the little triangle where my kids have gone to three different elementary schools, and I'm just ho hoping something will be addressed so 12 kids won't be going to a middle school out of their whole class, and then those 12 kids get used to three, you know, three years with these kids, and then 80% go to one school and then go back <laughs> to another school. And I don't have any complaints about any of the schools I've been to. And I've learned all the different personalities of all the different schools. But to keep pushing people up to Marshall is not the answer. I mean, they need to put an addition on Auburn or something. And I know you would have a million schools if you could, but somehow this needs to be addressed and brought out to the public so we pay for these schools because we can't keep pretending we're approving these housing. These houses are coming in and there's no room for them. We can't keep pushing them out to the outer parts of Parker County. Do you think that will be addressed at the middle schools? Yeah, this, this, this is a question I'm happy to try to evade because <laughs> I know very little about it. But I, I do, here's what I do know. Um, the process for re redistricting in Fauquier, I, I, don't, I don't know how they do it. I don't know the process for doing it. But I know that any time redistricting occurs anywhere, it's, you know, it's difficult. It's always difficult. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you what exactly the process was, what it looked like. I did come to the, you know, the hearing at Warrington Middle School, I guess in March or so, somewhere around there. And I, you know, I, I attended that and I heard a lot about folks who were upset about the redistricting and whatnot. I understand it completely, um, but I don't know enough about it to even give you an intelligent answer. Other than, yeah, it's very difficult, and uh, you know, I wish there was an easy way to sort of fix it. Uh, but to this point, this is how the school boards decided, and uh, you know, they don't like. They don't like it, that's for sure. They don't like redistricting. You start talking about redistricting anywhere, and people, you know, they immediately start ooh, hitting the panic button because no one likes it. But I don't know enough about the process to even tell you exactly how it was how it was studied. Um, I just got a lot of questions after I started in May about, you know, pretty much, I hope this is never going to happen again. And can you make sure it doesn't ever happen again? And you know, it's tough. As, as pockets of populations change, it's very difficult. But hopefully, we'll have a next time it has to happen. It'll be thoroughly vetted through the community and with parents and stakeholders and whatnot. Because I think that perhaps that was maybe the p one of the pieces that was missing. I don't know. But from what I'm hearing, that was a piece that was missing. Well, I don't see redistricting again in the near future. That's one thing. But from as far as what just happened with redistricting, it, it happened. I mean, it's, it's that ship sailed. But I don't see any in the near future, mainly because our population right now is on – we're stagnant right now. It looks like, according to Weldon Cooper, we're going to be stagnant um, for the next few years at least. So I don't see redistricting. Well, I, you know, stagnant from the like for kindergarten enrollment. It's actually we're down. So I, I can only speak to that piece. Weldon Cooper is some. They're usually right. They're not always right. Uh, they were often wrong in our last school division, my last school division. Um, but, yeah, I've been to Brookside, actually, and driven around there, and, wow, that place is just growing like crazy. <laughs> right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep. 
based on po based on pockets of population. It's a very passionate subject, no doubt about that. Any other questions? But we, yeah, you got to get on the mic though, because I. <laughs> okay, sorry. The um, tracking comment about um, specifically with math and how you would like in the eighth grade children to all be able to do the algebra. Um, the one thing I have seen through the elementary schools, the only tracking they, re I guess the biggest tracking they do is the GT program and the process of getting in to the GT program and given access to that highest level of learning, um, which I found was different than in Henrico County where we used to live. Uh, and I thought it would be statewide, but it's not. But anyway, um, that is the one place where I see uh, children get their confidence in math. And kids that are in that program generally have a high confidence in their math levels, whereas yep. the kids that wish to be in that program lose a little bit of that sometimes. Or they feel like they're, they're not quite at, they're not quite as good at math as some of their peers because of it. And I'm not saying, I'm not the type to think that you have to satisfy everyone but I do know like my older son coming over from Henrico County we came when he was in fifth grade and he had been in GT for math and reading throughout his years at, at Henrico and we came over here and he was technically eligible for the reading aspect but not the math but with some struggles we stayed in the math program because he was getting straight A's and everything had to put no effort in to anything. So it would have been ridiculous for him to get straight A's in everything with no effort. Whereas the math program, it took work for him and he managed to get pretty much straight B's. But just going through that whole process, I was surprised by how hard it is when a child is doing so well in the highest level below GT to actually be able to do the next jump up. Yeah, Th and that's because, <laughs> you're, you're, you're putting me back on my soapbox, you know, we, we should not we should not act as gatekeepers. We should be providing opportunities and rigor for all. And as my comment about math, you know, we should be providing rigor for all students, no matter where they are, at the, at wherever they are in the in the spectrum. Uh, and if we do that, I, my experience over 25 years has been kids will meet will rise to the level of your expectation. And I'll just tell you quick, in Greene County. And believe me, there's nothing spectacular about Greene County. It's a poor school division. And we had about, you know, probably 20, 25 kids, eighth graders, taking algebras, you know, in the eighth grade. And I asked the question, why do we, why do we limit the eighth grade to, you know, 20, 25 kids in Algebra 1? And the answer was, well, that's because that's the way we've always done it, and we, that's what we have room for. The follow-up question was, yeah, but how many kids could potentially be taking algebra one and being successful? And the answer I got, and I remember this conversation vividly, the answer was probably about 60. Well, then why aren't we doing that? That doesn't make any sense at all. Y you know, you raise the bar for those kids and the kids will be successful. And there's nothing, again, those kids, there's nothing in the water down there. You know, they, we've got up to 95% in algebra one or geometry and 100% pass rate on the SOL test, which, another story there, but the point is, they can do it, they can be successful. And it's just better preparing them. But it starts in fifth grade with pre-algebra skills being taught in fifth grade. And, you know, identifying, putting, including that in the curriculum, providing those skills in fifth grade. And then as they move into sixth grade, they're better prepared to take pre-algebra, learn more pre-algebra, and it prepares them for what lies ahead in seventh and eighth grade. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm, a, I'm just a huge advocate for pulling all kids up, having rigor for all, no matter where they are, and not serving as a gatekeeper. That's not, that should never be our role. That, you know, we, we have room for 20 in this program, and that's what we're going to have. We're going to have 20 kids in that program. That doesn't make any sense at all. You've got to provide the opportunities according to the kids, you know, where the kids are. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, and I found that in the middle school level and the high school level, that's definitely true. It's only been in the, the elementary school, the GT program specifically, that 
has been a little restricted. Right. So. All right, thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Sure. You mentioned earlier about when we should address the fact of kids going on to college. You should never say this student is going to go and this one's not because that's more or less like a stereotyping and you're downsizing this one and you're pumping this one up. You should say it's your choice to go to college and sit down and review the options. You can go full time, which is basically four classes in a given week, or you can break it up where you're only doing one or two classes in a given week and work a full time job. So you're not stressed out to take and do everything at once. Um, your reference to not enough degrees in computer science and so forth, have you looked at the latest requirements for some of those degrees? When I was going to the University of Arizona, they wanted me to have four semesters of a foreign language, four semesters all the way up to diversified mathematics, and have a 3.5. And I took the roundabout way and went down to the business unit, picked up my management information systems and operations management. Because when I did the comparison, I found out I could double measure. The electives for my MIS turned out to be the core for my OM. My electives for OM turned out to be the core for MIS, so I double measured. So it's a matter of understanding. <coughs> and kids aren't dumb. I mean, they get smarter as they go along. There's a lot of them that realize, hey, I can't get into the business, but I go over here to education where they only require 2.0, and I'll sneak back over here and take my business classes in order to get my business degree. And that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I guess the university caught on to it after about five years because they noticed they had a lot more people graduating in business than they had in education, even though they had a lot more people registered in education than they had in business. So it's a matter of trying to coax these kids. It took me 10 years to go back to college because much like you said, my instructors, oh, you'll never make it in college. You'll fail before you even begin. And you're stereotyping. You're putting them down before they even get started. Sit down and discuss, you know, it's your choice. It may be this year, it may be next year, or you may never go back. It's, it's entirely up to their choice. That's what we prepare you for. We're preparing you for life. And much like with life, everyone in here could do my job right now as long as they knew the correct terminology. Right. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate those comments. Anyone else? Oh, I saw a hand over here. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, again, you know, the, the goal, my goal here is to just absorb as much information as I can, hopefully answer a few questions, but, um, and again, the questions have been excellent <laughs> in both forums, really, really excellent, so, and I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, as I said in one of the slides, you know, sometimes adults disagree, and, um, uh, you know, one thing I, I, folks in Falkir are not afraid of is sharing an opinion, and I've noticed that in the last two months, <laughs> and people are happy to share their opinion, which is absolutely fine. But the other thing I've really appreciated is when I've been in conversation with folks, I said, well, I just don't agree. Or here's People are generally okay with that. And that's kind of nice. Uh, we, we're all adults, and we may disagree on which direction we're going or how we instruct kids and whatnot. But you can rest assured with me anyway, that, uh, and with, I think with all of our teachers and administrators, is you know, we're trying to do what's right for kids and make decisions that are in the best interest of kids. And sometimes that flies in the face of the adults, uh, and that creates conflict oftentimes. But you know, you got to do what's right, and and that's what that's what I'm going to try. That's what we're going to try to do. So, I thank you all very much. And again, this will be on the website or is on the website. And I hope you all have a great evening. Take care, and thanks for coming.